thanks everybody for being here. We're gonna go ahead and get started with tonight's program. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Lindsay Finneran and I have the pleasure of working with all the wonderful women of Ohio State every day as a member of the Alumni Association. And I'm so honored to welcome you all here tonight to our second uh, grant presentation of the year um, here at the Planetarium. Who is, who's the, is this their very first time here at the Planetarium? Oh, good, good, a lot of people. Well, I can definitely tell you you're in for a really wonderful presentation tonight. Um, I hope you already enjoyed the food and the drinks and the company and um, continue to do so for the remainder of the evening. Um, to get things started tonight, um, we are have started somewhat of a new tradition where we are inviting one of our members um, to at each event to read Women in Philanthropy's mission. So I am excited to introduce to you tonight one of our members, uh, Miss Emily Morris, and she's going to do that for us tonight. Thank you, Lindsay. Oh, I'm just going to hold this here. Oh. I need them all. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Women in Philanthropy at The Ohio State University connects generations of women who make a difference in the world by investing together in the people of Ohio State and their transformational work. And I'm gonna add to the end of this, hashtag Women for Ohio State. Yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> thank you. So I also want to note, um, everyone has a program on their chair as well, and there's space on the back of your program if you'd like to take any notes tonight. Um, this is our second of our three grant presentations this year. So if you're a member of Women in Philanthropy, we will be voting on tonight's presentation and how we would like to allocate our funding to them um, in May. So um, make sure to take any notes there if you want to refresh your memory um, or you, know, you have questions at the end of the presentation, you can definitely um, ask those questions and use that. And also, um, any questions we have, and we're using these microphones, and you'll notice the video cameras, um, this presentation will be recorded and will be on the Women in Philanthropy website. So we'll be sharing that out with all of our uh, members who are here tonight, as well as those who could not be here as well. <clears throat> um, so next, I just wanted to share a little bit of information because I know we do have um, a lot of not only members but guests in the planetarium here with us tonight. I'd like to invite everyone who is a member of Women in Philanthropy. Would you please stand? <laughs> Ooh. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I know that we also have um, a lot of guests with us, and I want to thank our members especially um, for your commitment, because Women in Philanthropy started just uh, with six women um, almost 12 years ago. So from that, we've grown into about 140 women today um, who collectively since then have funded over $1.3 million of incredible research and programs here at Ohio State, just like the ones that the one that you're gonna hear tonight. So thank you to all of our members for your incredible philanthropic leadership. And to our guests, you all are equally as important to us as well. Um, I wanna invite each of you to personally consider becoming a member tonight. Um, as you can see, we have quite a vibrant group of women for Ohio State. And we have membership levels that range from young professionals up to our traditional membership. So it truly is a way to feel connected to Ohio State and to really celebrate every woman's um, philanth personal philanthropic ability. Um, so lastly, I just want to introduce our speaker that we have tonight. Um, as I said, we have a wonderful presentation, and this is definitely an example of the type of programs that um, women in philanthropy are so proud to support. Um, our speaker tonight is one of our grant finalists for this year, Professor Todd Thompson from the Ohio State University Department of Astronomy. He's been faculty here at Ohio State since 2007, and he's a theoretical astrophysicist with very broad interests. Uh, some of those include the mechanisms of explosions of massive stars, the evolution and structure of galaxies, the dynamics of stellar systems, and the origins of heavy elements. So I'm sure he'll be able to tell us a lot more about what all of that means. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> um, 
But in 2014, he, became, he also became the first professor in the history of the astronomy department to receive the Ohio State University Alumni Association Award for Distinguished Teaching. So just really incredible um, faculty that we are able to have here with us tonight. So his presentation, he's going to share with you um, what he's applied to women in philanthropy for funding for is to share a little bit about his work. He's using robotic telescopes to basically photograph the entire sky every single night in hopes of capturing um, lots of different things, um, but especially one thing we'll talk about tonight are very rare but magnificent star explosions. So Dr. Thompson was grateful enough to travel with us to Naples just a few days ago for our annual Women in Philanthropy event there. So he did this presentation just a couple days ago, and um, we're really grateful that he's here uh, tonight with us as well. So please help me welcome Professor Todd Thompson. Thank you very much uh, for the nice three? introduction. <laughs> yeah, I do have several. Um, I'll take care of this uh, when we go back. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction and to give you a little idea of what you're going to see. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a short video, um, a movie, uh, just three or four minutes long to maybe get you in the spirit of astronomical discovery. And then we'll move into the presentation. And uh, so I'm going to tell you about this thing, which you, it's a little faded out, but uh, it'll get darker. Um, the all sky automated search for supernovae. And there are a couple great things about giving this presentation to you. One is that I get to introduce you to the planetarium. Another one um, is that I get to introduce you to some of the work that's being done at Ohio State's Department of Astronomy. And many of you uh, probably don't know that Ohio State Astronomy is is one of the best in the world, in the world. So we have a fantastic department of astronomy uh, filled with excellent researchers working on some of the things I'm going to tell you about tonight, the explosions of massive stars, the evolution of galaxies, but also many other things, planets, um, uh, the evolution of individual stars, and uh, galaxies, and so on. So I'm going to introduce you uh, to the astronomy department, to the planetarium. Uh, and we're going to start with this prelude of a video, and then we're going to come back uh, to the presentation. And then at the end, uh, there'll be time for any questions that you have. Okay?
All right, that was meant to be an inspiring prelude introduction to the presentation. Um, so again, uh, I'm Todd Thompson, and I'm going to be discussing the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae. I will warn you uh, that I will sometimes call it ASIS SN, and other times I will call it Assassin. Um, and that's partly because uh, we were named Assassin by, I don't know exactly how that name started, um, but it kind of stuck. And so I will alternate between, between calling it the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae, ASIS SN, and Assassin. And it's my pleasure to tell you some things um, about how uh, um, Assassin works um, and about what we're trying to do and about how um, the funding from women and philanthropy would be spent. So the first thing we could do is we can start on the oval, a familiar place to probably many of you. Um, and we can zoom time forward. Uh, we can see the rotation of the Earth, um, and uh, the stars begin to shine. But if you've ever spent time in Ohio, um, and you go out even on a dark, clear night, you might only see perhaps a hundred, few hundred stars, maybe, if you kill the light pollution and you go far away from Columbus, you might be able to see thousands of stars only. You don't get to see how truly awesomely huge uh, the universe is and even our galaxy is. So my first point that I want to make is that the universe is big. It's bigger, it's bigger even than you think. When you look out on the night sky and see only a few thousand stars, um, if you were able to take an even deeper image, for example, if you went to the southern hemisphere and you took a deep image of the Milky Way, you might see some thousands of stars, maybe 10,000, maybe 20,000, maybe more. You would see the center of the galaxy up there, the dark bands of the Milky Way, the dust and star formation, but you wouldn't see all of the stars that are there. How many stars are actually there? The number of stars that are actually there is about 100 billion in our galaxy, 100 billion stars like the sun. So if you want to compare that to a number, you can compare that to the population of the Earth, about 7 billion people on the planet Earth. You might, con you might compare that to the number of M&Ms you could fit in this building. Uh, the number of M&Ms that could fit in this building is approximately 100 billion. From floor to ceiling, all of the floors, including the basement of Smith Hall, if you filled it with M&Ms, you would have approximately the number of stars like the sun in the Milky Way. And it's part of this that we want to study and we want to understand. But you also might be wondering, well, that's the Milky Way. How many galaxies are there in the universe? And so it's interesting to imagine, and you can kind of do this here, if you hold up your arm up at the night sky and you look, what you might be able to see, there might be just enough light for you to see the end of your finger. And the end of your finger, if you imagine, choose a dark spot on the dome. Choose a dark spot on the dome and imagine that single piece of your fingernail, your little fingernail extended at arm's length. Imagine that that one dark patch of sky where maybe nothing has ever been seen before. We took the world's most powerful telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and we looked at exactly that direction, at that place where you see nothing and perhaps no one has ever seen anything before, that little fingernail of sky. What would you see on that fingernail of sky? That tiny little fingernail of sky would contain the image you see above you, which maybe has 20,000 galaxies in it. 20,000 galaxies. And each of these galaxies, you can pick whichever one you want, each of those galaxies has about 100 billion stars. And this is in a dark patch of the sky. And so if you imagine holding that little finger up again and moving your little finger to the side and to the side and to the side and tiling the whole sky with little fingernails, um, behind each of your fingernails, behind each of those little tilings would be these 20,000 galaxies. You can zoom in a little bit. Maybe this one, I like this gold one this gold galaxy. 
It's impressive to imagine 100 billion stars like the sun maybe one billion years ago sending out their light and that light flying across the universe for a billion years and then reaching the Hubble Space Telescope, which we just put up in space in the 90s. And you can even zoom in on a, I don't know, some, some little tiny galaxy right here, maybe. Maybe that one, or that one if you like. Some distant smudge uh, in our Hubble Space Telescope that contains 100 billion suns. So what do we see when we look out? We see galaxies of all kinds. And how many galaxies are there? Well, that's easy because we just did the number of stars. The number of stars in the, uni this number of stars in the galaxy is 100 billion. The number of galaxies that are roughly the size of the Milky Way, any of the ones you see here, is also about 100 billion. So if you want to do the math, that would be 100 billion times 100 billion stars, which is 10 to the 22, or one with 22 zeros after it, stars. So the universe is big. And the universe also erupts and explodes and changes. When I show you all those pictures of either the Milky Way or those galaxies in deep space taken by a Hubble Space Telescope, you don't get any sense for the fact that the universe actually is evolving and changing as we speak. Massive stars like this one, very famous star called Eta Carina, is exploding. Um, maybe has died in a supernova already and we're just waiting for the light to get to us. There are galaxies like this. This is an entire massive galaxy. You're seeing the light from 100 billion stars. And at the center of that galaxy, right there, dead center, is a supermassive black hole, maybe one billion times the mass of the sun. And it's shooting out jets of high energy radiation that are flying off into space. And we see these supermassive black holes eating gas and fluctuating. We see asteroids flying by. We see stellar flares from stars like the sun and other stars. And then we see galaxies. Here's another galaxy, the light of 100 billion suns there, and the supernova going off, um, a star dying uh, in its outskirts. So the universe erupts and explodes and moves and changes. And you might rightfully ask, how can we watch it all? Maybe. But maybe your first question is, why would we watch it all? So I first want to tell you why, and then I want to tell you how. So why do we want to watch it all? Well, the first thing I'll tell you is something, something we know. We know that normal stars like the sun get to the end of their lives, and they produce white dwarf stars. So this is a star that's throwing off its outer envelopes. It's a bit like the sun at the end of its life. And at the center is a being born white dwarf star. And we also know that a small percentage of these white dwarf stars stars that are born from the death of stars like our sun explode as supernovae. We see them explode. I've actually shown you one picture of that kind of supernova already. And they explode at the rate of about one every 200 years in a Milky Way-like galaxy. So here's one going off. This is one of those white dwarf supernovae. And why is it important? Well, it's important because those type of supernovae, the white dwarf supernovae, are the source of iron in your blood. They are the primary source of iron in the universe, in fact. And the mechanism of their explosion is unknown. So what we're trying to find is the supernovae, and we're trying to understand why and how they explode. The same is true for massive stars. So here I put up a picture of Orion. You can see Orion's right shoulder, his left shoulder, his belt, his feet. Okay, and this star right here, the right shoulder of Orion, is a very special star named Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is one of the stars we know of that has a mass that's more than 10 times the mass of the sun. And we also know that these stars also die about every century in the Milky Way. And before they do, they get huge and red and luminous, just like Betelgeuse. And when they explode, they enrich the universe with oxygen oxygen. So why do you care about oxygen? Well, you care about oxygen for a whole bunch of reasons, almost every reason that there is. If you've ever heard of the law of threes, the rule of threes, right? you'll die in three weeks without food, three days without water, and three minutes without air. So what do you need for food? What you need for food is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen like the sugar in your yogurt, C6H12O6. All of those O's that go into C6H12O6, one of my favorite sugars, are from stars dying like Betelgeuse. 
The water, H2O, all of those O's are from explosions like Betelgeuse. And the air you breathe, also importantly constituted by oxygen from Betelgeuse. How do massive stars explode? We don't actually know. We see them explode, but we don't know how. That's what we're trying to figure out. So here, for example, is a picture of a star that has blown itself to bits. In about the 1600s, it exploded. And what you see is the remnants of a massive star. In blue and red and white here, you see the oxygen, the silicon, and the iron flying out. Many of you are using cell phones tonight. That silicon that, silicon that goes into that is also from uh, supernovae. So why are we interested? Why do we want to know? We want to know because we're interested in the origin of things, the origin of everything. And so here is a beautiful galaxy, one of my favorites. And this galaxy pinwheels around in the sky. And you and I, with our short 100-year lives, get to see just a tiny, tiny, tiny and infinitesimal turning of this galaxy. Our galaxy, like this galaxy, takes about 250 million years to go around once. So if you pick maybe some stars here, in 250 million years, they will have gone all the way around. 250 million years. Put that in context, the dinosaurs died 65 million years ago at the end of the Cretaceous period. And since then was the rise of the mammals. So you'll see all these points of light. Many of these points of light that you're seeing are massive stars inside that galaxy. And I just said that a massive star or these white dwarf supernovae explode about every 100 or 200 years. So in our lifetime, this galaxy might produce just one, maybe, or a couple supernova explosions. But if you imagine in your mind's eye being able to live not just for 100 years, but for 100 million years or 200 million years, so you saw a full turning of this galaxy, in that amount of time, one million supernovae would have gone off. So you should imagine, pow, 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 explosions going off. And those explosions, as I've told you, are enriched with iron, silicon, carbon, and oxygen, the elements of our existence and perhaps all existence. And those supernovae go off, and they enrich the gas and the dust for future stellar generations. And you, so you should think of this as some kind of cosmic ecosystem, every single one of these 100 billion galaxies self-enriching itself to produce the elements um, that we need. So that's why we're interested. The nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff, a famous quote from Carl Sagan that I'm sure many of you know. So why do we want to watch it all? Well, we want the best supernova survey ever. And why? Because we want to see all these white dwarf supernovae and these massive star supernovae because we want to understand how they happen and why they happen. But also, we want to watch everything at once. Everything, all the time. As much of the entire universe as we can. And why? So that we can find unknown unknowns. Things that no one has ever seen, and indeed, no one has ever anticipated. There could be out there right now, perhaps a billion years ago, some unprecedented event in the history of the universe occurred and sent out light in all directions, and it's just waiting to come into our telescopes. So what did we do? Um, led by our primary PIs, Chris Stanek, who's here, and Chris Kachanek, we built a global partnership. That partnership began and originated at Ohio State and indeed includes many graduate students like Tom Holoin, who just finished his PhD, John Brown, who's about to finish his PhD, uh, here, um, new graduate student, um, Turindu J. Zinga, uh, Romy Martinez, who's working with Professor Laura Lopez on stellar explosions, uh, Diego Godoy Rivera, who many of you met, who's here tonight, he worked on a uh, supernova that I'm going to tell you about later. We also have former students Jose Prieto and Subo Dong who've gone on to be professors in Chile and in China respectively. And we collaborate with many institutions including Laura Chamiak at Michigan State um, on a variety of different topics that I'm going to have a chance to talk to you about. We're funded primarily uh, by philanthropic organizations uh, like yours. So you see women in philanthropy here, the Moore Foundation, the Mount Cuba Foundation. We also have a partnership 
with Las Cumbres Observatory. Um, we've received funding from the NSF, and then these are our institutional partners. And so what we did is we began a plan to observe the entire sky every night. And the current state of the project is that we have built telescopes here in Texas, here in Haleakala, Hawaii, two sets of telescopes. I'll show you what they look like in just a second in Chile, and then another set in uh, Sutherland, uh, South Africa. And what do these telescopes do? Here are a couple pictures of these telescopes. I'll give you more detail on the next slide. But what we're doing is that the telescopes here, 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 and here take robotically many, many, many pictures per night, approximately 12,500 images. And we're going to about 25,000 times fainter than the human eye. Now these telescopes, as I'm going to show you, are made of Nikon uh, lenses and, uh, and fancy cameras. And those allow us, with a 90 second exposure, to see a supernova, a luminous supernova, about a billion light years away. And so what we have, here's the robot exercising itself. These are the Nikon lenses. On the back are uh, CCD cameras in the neighborhood of some tens of thousands of dollars for each of these. And you'll remember we have five units, so 20 telescopes total. Each camera covers about 10,000 square degrees of the night sky every night with exposures of 90 seconds, as I mentioned. Five sites, 20 total telescopes, millions, tens of millions of sources every night. And what we're doing is we're monitoring the entire sky all the time, every night. We're trying to make the first time-lapse movie of the universe. And what we've produced is an unprecedented engine for discovery. So what do we do? Well, so imagine this is the night sky and our robots turn on. Their little domes open uh, wherever it's dark and they pick a small patch of sky, maybe over here, uh, maybe over here. And what do they do? They take pictures. Okay. And each one of those pictures, each one of those pictures gets put together with the previous images. Okay. And what we have is a, what we call a reference image. This would be the best set of images that we have of this particular field. You'll see there are sources all over the place, and this is zoomed in on actually a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not just one galaxy. It's actually one big galaxy surrounded by some satellite galaxies. And this is one um, of the Magellanic Clouds, famously used by, uh, for navigation uh, by Magellan. And so, on any given night, we take one of our 12,500 pictures, and it might look a little bit like this, but also slightly different. And what we do is we compare that picture with that reference image, all of the previous pictures that have come before. And comparing it, by comparing it, I mean we take the two pictures and we subtract them. We take one picture, our best picture, and our new picture, and we subtract them, and what do we get? We get this. All the white spots are places that got dimmer, and all the black spots are places that got brighter in comparison with our last pictures, our best, our reference image. And this is what happens. Even on that one small field centered on one part of this huge universe, we get this. And then what do we do? Well, what we find is about 10 million new variable sources per night, sometimes 20 million. And so what do we do? Well, what we do is we have a graduate student sit and look through those 20 million pictures <laughs> every single morning. And if they don't finish, they don't get to go to lunch. <laughs> it's not a winning strategy, but you know, anyway. So what we do is we actually have an artificial intelligence machine learning classifier that goes through and it looks at every single detection of something that could be something that changed. And we get, we cull those tens of millions of candidates down to hundreds of candidates. And those hundreds of candidates are looked at by eye by Professor Chris Stanek, the PI, who many of you met this evening. And he has looked at hundreds of images per day for thousands of days. Thousands of days. And so I'll show you one discussion. There's a discovery. This is what the data look like, or this is at least what the thumbnails look like of a new discovery. So here 
is our best reference image. You will see it's got some stars in it, some bright lights. And here is where there's a new source here, um, which is helpfully labeled. You could probably barely read it, but it's helpfully labeled Ceres. Ceres is a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. And yes, we found Ceres. We were not the first to find Ceres. Ceres was discovered some time ago. But what this shows you is that here, all of a sudden, there's a new source, and it's seen by two different cameras. And then here, you don't see it, and here, you don't see it, and here, you don't see it, although you see a streak. So that's a discovery of Ceres. So good for us. We discovered Ceres. Here's something maybe a little bit more interesting, but also something that's known. Here is our reference image. There's a bright star. It's helpfully labeled with some numbers, which tell us that it's a variable star. It's a known variable star. And you can see looking backwards in time, this is backwards in time from the date, you can see that it's changing because it's a big black dot. You can also see that there's a white dot here, and a white dot here, and a white dot there, and a white dot there. That's noise. And the machine learning classifier, the computer, says you don't need to look at that. You should focus on this. And so this is a known variable star, and it's very easy to detect. But we're talking about millions and millions and millions of objects culled down to hundreds. And so what about this? Here's an example of something more interesting. So here is our best reference image. Here is some something, bright stars. Here's a little smudge back there. And here is the position of some new source, potentially. So you'll see there's a little dark mark there, a little dark mark there. And that previously, there was no dark mark, no dark mark, no dark mark, and no dark mark. So maybe something got brighter. Maybe that's a new supernova, or maybe it's not. Here's an example that's even harder. Here's a place where the green circle shows you there's nothing. And then there's a little black dot. Maybe you could see it. Maybe. Little black dot there. Maybe there's a little black dot there, a little black dot there. And the question is, what is that? What is it? Is that noise? Or is that the biggest, most whopping explosion ever seen in the history of humanity? The problem with astronomy is you don't really know. First of all, even if it is a real object, it could be super close by, and that's why you detected it. Or it could be the biggest, most whopping explosion ever seen, and it's just on the other side of the universe. And so you barely detect it. And so that's the problem we're up against. And so to give you an idea of how long this problem has plagued astronomers, I wanted to take you back. Here we are again on the oval. We're facing towards Orion. Here, there's Betelgeuse, your buddy. There's the three belt stars. Okay, Betelgeuse might explode tonight. And if it does, if Betelgeuse exploded right now, um, it would be a beautiful and bright uh, explosion, would be as bright as the full moon uh, for several weeks. It would be quite spectacular. There would be no night. But I want to take you back to 1054, 1054 AD. And that was one of the last times that humanity had people who were dedicated to looking at the sky all the time. And so the Chinese in 1054, during the Song Dynasty, in fact, on July 4th of the Song Dynasty, what they saw was a new bright light so here is Orion, and actually over here is Taurus. And what they saw was a new bright light up in this area. They called it a guest star, just a new bright light that showed up for 23 days. They could see it. And the question for them was, what is it? And the answer, they didn't have any idea. They didn't have any idea. Just like you, when you look up at the sky, if you saw a little bright dot, what would you, how would you figure out what it is? How would you know what it is? It's similar to Tycho. Tycho, famous astronomer, now we jump forward 500 years, famous astronomer walking home, or at least this is the way the story goes, was looking in the direction of Cassiopeia. You can kind of see Cassiopeia here. And he noted there was a new star at this position, which he called Nova Stella. New star in Cassiopeia. But again, what was it? He didn't have any idea. So what we can do is what they couldn't do. We can go look. If you get dizzy, close your eyes. We can go look. We can zoom in. We can use bigger telescopes. They had no telescopes. We can use telescopes to zoom in 
on what the Chinese saw in 1054. And what did they see? They saw the Crab Nebula here, which you could see. And I can zoom in even more because we are very powerful. We are much more powerful than the Chinese in 1054 in terms of our technology and our imaging ability. This is what the Chinese saw in 1054. They didn't know what it was. They thought it was a guess. They thought it was something. It was a light in the sky. Okay. And now we know it is the expanding debris of a massive star. And this is the debris, the oxygen, magnesium, and silicon I was talking about before, flying out into space and enriching the interstellar medium, the medium of galaxies, the place where new stars are going to form out of that enriched matter. Similarly with Tycho, suppose we take our best telescope and we point it in the direction Tycho said. What do we see? We see the Tycho supernova remnant. We see the remains of a white dwarf supernova now, not a massive star supernova, but a white dwarf supernova. And we see the enriched debris filled with iron flying out into space just as I described before. And so that's the power of what we can do today, is we can follow up our discoveries. We can make new observations that shed light on what we see. So when we look at a picture like this, and I show you nothing, and then almost nothing, nearly nothing, and then probably nothing, definitely nothing, probably nothing, maybe some, I don't know. We're in a similar situation to the Chinese in 1054. We didn't discover it with the naked eye. We discovered it with a $20,000 Nikon lens and a $20,000 camera sitting behind it on a robot scattered all over the world, monitoring the night, the night, every single night, and a huge amount of software. But the key is that we need to take our discoveries and turn them into discoveries. A discovery is not a discovery unless you know what it is. Okay? And so here is a picture, a better, more sensitive observation that shows us the nature of the thing we have discovered. So in fact, here at the center is a galaxy and then a bright dot, which shows you a new supernova in an uncatalogued galaxy. And so this is what we have been doing. We have been discovering supernovae and all kinds of other things. And we have been trying to be uh, the best survey we could be. And we have been using these follow-up facilities, including you know, one meter mirrors. So these are not our little Nikon lenses. Um, but instead a meter uh, uh, telescope one meter across to huge 6.5 meter uh, telescopes to even bigger. In fact, Ohio State is a member of the biggest optical telescope in the world right now, the large binocular telescope, where each mirror seen here is 8.4 meters across, 8.4 meters, so that's more than 25 feet, each of those mirrors. And we use these follow-up facilities to get exquisite data to verify that the little smudges that we've seen, really Chris Stanek has seen, um, in his hours and hours and hours looking at those images, we can verify that they're real, and we can try to figure out what they are. And so a reasonable question is, what are they, and how are we doing? So now I just want to tell you about the supernovae. We are the best, most unbiased survey for nearby bright supernovae in history. Indeed, we completely dominate the local census. For example, between January 1st and December 31st of 2016, 232 to total supernovae were discovered. 135 were by assassin. 37 were by amateurs, where that should really be in quotation marks. These people uh, are impressive. They uh, get home from a, you know, a full day's work and then stay up all night uh, looking at, at, uh, at galaxies trying to find new supernovae, and they make up the bulk of the rest, and then we have other professional surveys here that are mostly looking for much, much fainter supernovae. Nobody is covering the entire sky all the time uh, like we are, and that's why we're cleaning up on nearby bright supernovae. And so this is producing this unbiased survey, the first unbiased census, and this is work being led by graduate student John Brown and former graduate student Tom Holloin has just moved on to a prestigious postdoctoral position. We also have 
the largest collection of the largest stellar flare. So it turns out that the sun ha undergoes flaring activity, and indeed all stars do. Um, stars actually of lower mass have bigger flares. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how big the flares can get and whether or not they might be able to prevent the habitability of their planets. So we know now that planets are common. They're all over the galaxy, and many, many stars have planets. The question of whether or not they're habitable might come down to the question of whether or not massive stellar flares destroy them, rip off their atmospheres, and otherwise harm them. And this is current work by Romy Martinez um, and her advisor, Laura Lopez, here um, at Ohio State. We also have discovered some things we maybe didn't expect to see, or at least we were hopeful that we saw them. Um, and here, what I'm doing is I'm showing you the center of our galaxy. This is a picture of the center of our galaxy. And at the center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And what we find is that stars orbit this 4 million solar mass black hole in the Milky Way. And most other galaxies have black holes at their center. And the question over the last few years, last many years, has been what happens if stars, these are stars orbiting the supermassive black hole at our galactic center in animation, what happens if gas clouds or stars get too close to supermassive black holes is they get torn apart. Gas clouds and stars are fluffy things. Um, and if you throw them in close to a supermassive black hole, um, they get torn apart and destroyed. And when they do, it makes a big, bright optical flare that we can see from across the universe. And so this is a simulation. We can't actually produce these pictures, but we can do a simulation of a star being destroyed by a black hole. You'll see the star get torn apart by the black hole here. There's the star, boom, and it dies. Certainly whatever planetary system it included also died at that time or was flung into space. And so this is a supercomputer simulation um, by researchers at University of Santa Cruz showing the destruction of a star by a supermassive black hole and the subsequent eating as the gas falls down into the supermassive black hole. And this type of a thing is called a tidal disruption event. Tidal disruption event means bad thing happens to a star by supermassive black hole. And you will see our spectacular image of a tidal disruption event right here. This is an image only a mother or father could love of one of their children. This is our best reference image of the center of a galaxy, and that's the star, the bright light we saw of a star being torn, uh, rend asunder uh, by a close encounter with a supermassive black hole. And we have three of these events so far, and there were only 10 known previously. And it's important to emphasize that we have the brightest, most nearby, and well-studied events. And we're trying to figure out what is the rate of these stars being eaten by black holes, and what can we learn about black holes as they grow. And this was work led for his PhD um, by Tom. Finally, I show you one of the pictures that I showed you before. So this was a picture of nothing and a picture of probably nothing, but maybe something. And I said, maybe it's the most biggest, most whopping supernova that's ever happened in the history of humanity, and that turns out to be right. That turns out to be right. So using follow-up observations, like the ones we propose for women in philanthropy, here is the galaxy uh, that we could not see in our image, um, but the galaxy sitting there that hosted this big, huge, spectacular supernova is center. And this is the whole galaxy lit up by the supernova light, by the blue light from the supernova. You'll see that the galaxy before the supernova was this red kind of blob of 100 million stars, actually maybe more, more like 500 million stars. And here is this beautiful blue glow of Assassin 2015 LH, the biggest, most whopping supernova ever seen. This was work led by former graduate student Subo Dong and the rest of the collaboration. And I should say that this is one of those unknown unknowns. Those completely unprecedented events were not really expected, and nothing like it had ever been seen before or predicted. It challenges all theories for its origin, and I'm the theoretical astrophysicist in the group and have worked hard on the origin of the most luminous supernovae. 
And it's not just that this is the most luminous supernova ever discovered, it's that it might be the most luminous supernova that ever can be. That is, even when we try to make the biggest, most luminous, most whopping supernova explosion we possibly can, in our mind's eye, as theoretical astrophysicists, this is about as luminous as we could possibly make such a source. When I describe what I do to the public, uh, to elementary school kids, uh, and, to, and to adults, I tell them my job is actually quite peculiar. What I do is I look at things that have been discovered, new things that have been discovered, new observations that have been made of the universe, and what I do is I imagine. That's what I do. I take all of my training in physics and I sit with a piece of paper um, or a computer and I take the laws of physics and I combine them with my imagination and try to produce a story or a physical picture for how something works. And this is one of those places where we see something that was not expected and pushes all of those theories to their absolute maximum. I can also tell you there was an incredibly exciting time publishing this. Uh, Chris Danik, Chris Kachanik, me, Subo, um, ben Chappi, other members of the collaboration, we did interviews with the BBC, with CNN, with the Wall Street Journal, with Forbes, PBS, and so on. I can't tell you the excitement of walking into my office and the phone ringing. I picked up the phone and they say, hello, is this Professor Thompson? And I say, yes, this is Professor Thompson. And they say, this is CNN, we're patching you through to the studio. And I was like, oh my God. I was very scared. It turned out to be okay. So I want to conclude. The All Sky Automated Survey for Supernovae is the world's most successful survey for bright supernovae of all types. It's the, currently the worldwide leader uh, in discovery, and we're trying to provide new constraints on the physics of these supernovae, trying to understand their mechanisms. We've discovered the most luminous supernova ever. You will see that I put a question mark at the end of that supernova on the last two slides, and that's because, because it challenges all of our theories. We're actually at a bit of a loss of what it might be. We've discovered the nearest and brightest and most well-studied tidal disruption events, most of them. We've discovered the biggest stellar flares in our Milky Way, and we're trying to assess that for the habitability of planets. And then there's actually a whole bunch of other things I'm not going to talk to you about, some things I wish I could talk to you about, but we won't go on that long. We've discovered some of the brightest novae. This is work being led by Laura Chamiak at um, Michigan State. We're finding new physics, new understanding about how those things work. Tarindu Jayazinga, a graduate student here, has just published a new catalog of about 60,000 new variable stars. And then I have actually just used the system um, in a new way, combined with another data set, to discover what seems to be a black hole um, in an orbit with another star in an unprecedented system. Um, exactly the kind of thing we weren't expecting, exactly the kind of thing that we're happy to use the system for. And if I wasn't giving this presentation to you fine folks right now, um, I would be off writing that paper um, on this newly discovered system. <laughs> the key is that every discovery requires follow-up observations. Otherwise, it is not a discovery. It requires analysis. It requires other, more precise observations, usually by our graduate students. And this is where Women in Philanthropy comes in. It's what the funding would be used for, to do these follow-up observations, to make our discoveries in Assassin actual discoveries, and to understand what is actually going on, and to write papers. And I want to leave you with these thoughts, which is that every day the system returns these hundreds of candidates. New things right now, even right at this moment, are waiting to be seen and understood for the first time. And I'll leave you with our motto, uh, which is that humanity should have a record of the sky. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll just say that the most powerful optical telescope, that is light that you would see with your eyeballs, um, is arguably the large binocular telescope, which OSU is a partial share in Arizona. The other most powerful optical telescopes are in Chile and in Hawaii. Um, on the top of the top of the big island. But I want to qualify that a little bit because um, in this image, which you can't really see now, it's washed out, but you may have seen it briefly, there were a bunch of big radio dishes. And those radio dishes, uh, there you go, thank you very much. These radio dishes um, are also in Chile. 
and they are the most powerful at looking at certain types of radio waves. Um, and so, and actually, one of the pictures I showed you before was of Tycho supernova remnant. And Tycho supernova remnant, that image was actually taken in the x-rays. Same kind of x-rays, not so different from the x-rays you would use to uh, check out your, your, your bo broken or not broken bones. Um, and we use that to observe um, supernovae too. So um, optical uh, is also the Hubble Space Telescope in space, takes optical observations. So that's the, that's the answer to your question. How far back in time can you actually see? So the age of the universe um, is 13.8 billion years, approximately. So you can look back to, roughly speaking, about that time. Um, roughly speaking. There are some details um, about how far back um, you can look because of the stretching of the universe and the accelerated expansion of the universe, um, but some 10 billion years. That's how far you can see. Um, the actual universe, we believe, is much, much, much bigger than what we can see. So, um, you know, you are the center of your observable universe, but because the universe is only so old, and because of the finite speed of light, your view of the universe is actually highly circumscribed. So you should imagine, when you imagine the whole universe, you can imagine a big table, and then go walk up to the middle of the table and draw a little circle, put a dot in the middle of the circle, and you would be the observer at the center of your observable universe, and that circle, the bigger circle you drew, would be your observable universe, but the actual universe, we believe, extends far beyond that horizon, and we do call it a horizon. It's a horizon set by the age of the universe and by the speed of light. Okay, thank you. Um, so the question is, can I tell you a little bit about the new black hole that I discovered? Um, so we are looking for, we see evidence of black holes all over the place. I refer to one type of black hole we see, which is a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies. But there's another type of black hole, which is a black hole we think forms from collapsing stars. So today I emphasize the explosions of massive stars, which we think don't produce black holes. But we also think, and we have good reason to believe, also because of Ohio State researchers, also because of Chris Kachanik and Chris Danik and other, our other colleagues, we also think that some massive stars just wink out of existence. They just form black holes, their cores collapse, and they form into a black hole. They literally zip, swallow up their star. Okay. Now, that's the type of black hole we're talking about. And then the other thing is that most stars are in binary systems. Most stars are actually two stars, and they're orbiting around each other. And so what I found is the first instance uh, we know of where a very distant binary composed of one star and another something that collapsed to a black hole uh, has been seen. And the way we found it was this star turns out to be, um, it turns out to get brighter and dimmer turns out to get brighter and dimmer every time it orbits around this black hole. Um, and so we spent a while, we first figured out that it was a black hole system partially because of this brightening and dimming, and then we've been spending the last several months trying to figure out why it's brightening and dimming. So um, that's the story of that. And it's in the outer galaxy, it's in the constellation Orija, um, and uh, we found it for the first time. So that's a paper that's coming. Other questions? Okay, so the question is, what's the timetable, basically? All these pictures are being taken continuously through the night, um, and we might hand off from one observatory to the other. As I mentioned, some are in Hawaii, some are in South Africa, some are in Chile, so the night is moving, the dawn is coming, um, and those pictures are being taken. Those pictures, once they're taken, are processed automatically overnight um, by the system, and at some point in the morning, sort of morning, could be the middle of the night, um, Professor Stanek over there is presented with 300, 200 candidates. He goes through, and some of the things he sees are really noise. So he will see one of those black dots, just like the ones I was pointing to, and it will not be a real source. But what he does is he posts that on a web page, and we start to get, um, and what happens then is astronomers around the world, part of our collaboration, look at that web page and they say, okay, Stanek says there might be a new source here. That can happen within an hour or a couple hours of discovery, a few hours. Then once they say, hey, it looks like there's something, and it looks like it might be the most luminous supernova in history, then 
um, we start making phone calls. So on the time scale of half a day to a day to several days to even then, you know, more and more telescopes, weeks and months following up what's going on. But hours is what you should have in mind. So the question is, how do we go back in time and know what the sky looked like at any given time? Um, and, and, and how does that actually work? So, I mean, it, it really is, so there, basically, so we'll start, the, the simplest answer to that is to begin and say all the stars are basically fixed with respect to the sun. That turns out not to be true. It turns we're all winging around the galaxy and all the stars are slightly moving. And you would notice it if you sat there for 100 years and kept very close track of where the stars are. But let's just, so let's just pretend that most of the stars are mostly fixed for timescales of 100 years or 1,000 years. Okay. Then what you do is you trace back the motion of the Earth around all the way back, which you use Newton's laws of gravitation, the laws of gravitation, to trace back the orbit of the Earth um, you could do that with all of its perturbations by Jupiter and by uh, all the other bodies in the solar system to go back, 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 and the Earth is spinning at a constant rate, uh, which we know. And we also know that the Earth's tilt precesses. Right now, the North Star is the North Star, but in some tens of thousands of years, the North Star will not be the North Star. The Earth will have precessed a little bit. We know about that. We know about all these motions, and we can just run them backwards, and project what the sky would have looked like at that time using the laws of gravitation and what we know about um, the orbit of the, of the Earth. So we can go back to 1054 AD um, or even further, and the only extra bit of complication is that the stars are actually moving. And so we actually measure the movement of the stars across the sky, and we know that because we've measured all of them. And so we can trace them backwards, too. So we can actually construct what the sky would have looked like for Aristotle or Eratosthenes or any of the ancient Greeks. Um, and we can go back in time and do that. Now, there could have been an astronomical event that we don't know about, in which case we wouldn't know. Okay? Um, some of these events we have records for, like the Chinese record this 1054 supernova, Tycho records this supernova. Um, and so we can find, we can go back to that location. Um, but otherwise, we don't have a way to go back in time to see things that are transient. Okay, so the question is, you know, you've got your system is working. You know, now what are you going to do? How are you going to produce a reliable understanding of what happened? So I'll give you a reliable understanding of, let's say, how massive stars explode. So what we're, what we're looking for is some clues. Clues. It turns out, let me just, a clue is that smaller galaxies have different supernovae than bigger galaxies. Why? Well, we spent some considerable amount of time thinking about that. They're different in their average properties. We know that's a clue. It's a clue to the mechanism. It's a clue to the how the stars evolve. Why would, the, why would supernovae in one type of galaxy be different than another? It actually turns out that some galaxies don't have as much iron, carbon, oxygen, and stuff in them and so the mass of stars in them don't have all those elements. They're more made of hydrogen and less made of these other elements. Whereas in a big galaxy, they're more made of the other elements and a little bit less of hydrogen. And that somehow has a deterministic relationship to how the supernova eventually goes off. So I basically sit and think about that. Like, what's the clue? So what we want is a survey that tells us that in this type of galaxy, this type of supernova goes off, and these are how their properties change when we look at different types of galaxies or different types of environments within galaxies, and we want an unbiased survey. Unbiased. So the problem is, is that I showed you the bar chart. The bar chart, whole bunch of supernovae discovered by assassin, woohoo! And then the next most was by amateurs. But it's interesting, the amateurs, these are guys like uh, a collaborator of ours who's an anesthesiologist, so by day, and then in the middle of the night, he takes his $100,000 of equipment and points it at galaxies. But where does he look? He looks only at big galaxies, big, beautiful spiral galaxies that he knows. And so his survey is biased because he is looking only at big galaxies. And he never would be able to tell you the thing that I just told you, which is that supernovae vary if you're looking at little wimpy galaxies or big galaxies. 
So we need an unbiased survey, and that's going to give us clues. And then hopefully, if we stitch all those clues with some suitably creative brains um, and uh, physics, we will understand all. There's always some work to do. So we, so some of these, and, and the thing is, when we go looking, then we find totally new things. And then those begin the process of trying to figure out what's, what's going to happen with those. Um, and the question is, how, what are the, how are the solar systems different on the inside uh, versus the outside? Um, that's a great question. It's one that we actually don't have a complete answer to. Uh, but I can tell you a few things. Uh, um, what we find is that Galaxies on their insides have more of the elements that are important for life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and iron. And we find um, that at least some types of planets, like Jupiter mass planets, are correlated with that in the sense that if you see stars that have more of these carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and iron, you're more likely to see a Jupiter. Okay? And that's a clue about how Jupiters form and why they care about having this, these metals. So the insides of galaxies tend to be more metal rich, but they also tend to be a lot older. Um, and in billions of years, things can happen to solar systems. They can become dynamically unstable. A bunch of things can happen to them. Um, and so we're just starting to actually probe the distribution of planets and the properties of solar systems, extrasolar systems, as a function in the galaxy. But we do actually expect them to vary. In fact, some people, including myself, um, have theorized that the very center of the galaxy might be very inhospitable uh, to planets, um, massive planets, and possibly for life in the very inside of the galaxy. So it, it could be. Um, this has yet to be verified. Um, but people are working on it, that there might actually be more planets, at least per star, in the outer parts of the galaxy in, rather than in the inside. But then other people are saying, but what about this metal thing? You just said that more carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, more, more planets on the inside than the outside. And so we're working on it. But can we get another round of applause for Dr. Thompson? Thank you. Thank you. So just a few um, quick things before we wrap up. Um, I just want to remind everyone that our next event is on April 10th, Tuesday, April 10th, and this is our third grant presentation of the year, our third and final one. And um, this event is going to be really exciting as well. I know this is going to be very hard to top, um, but we are going to be at the OSU Steam Factory, which is in Franklinton. So if you're not familiar with the Steam Factory, it's a really, really um, innovative, collaborative space um, made up of multidisciplinary faculty from Ohio State. Um, and they bring all sorts of research and creativity together there. And our presenter for that evening is Dr. Paul Sutter. He is a cosmological researcher here at Ohio State, and he's also the chief scientist at COSI. So um, this evening at the Ohio State Steam Factory, um, all I'm going to put out there is um, a night of of craft cocktails and adult science experiments. So <laughs> mark your calendars for that. Um, all of our members will receive an early invitation to RSVP for that because um, we are expecting a pretty, pretty big crowd. Um, and if you're a guest with us here tonight, I would love to talk with you more about becoming a member. Um, downstairs where we'll have dessert, I'll be at our membership table and I can provide you with more information um, and confirm your membership tonight. Our work here in Women in Philanthropy, um, supporting incredible things like what you've heard about tonight, um, our strength and the only way we can do that is in numbers. So the more women for Ohio State that we have that um, are a part of Women in Philanthropy, the greater impact that we can have on Ohio State, on our communities, and in our galaxies. So um, please consider joining us. And um, with that, um, the elevator, or if you need your steps today, right outside the door, um, we're just going down to the first floor lobby, and we'll um, conclude our evening there. So thank you very much. <laughs>